let's discuss a case study involving the normal modes of a disk drive. This was a study of one of the original disk drive models that was being created in Ann Arbor, Michigan by a fellow named Sam Irwin. He had been a pioneer in the whole business of computing and terminals, smart terminals, and so on, and recognized the need for compact disk drives to fit into PCs. We're going to talk about some of the design considerations here. Uh, in route, I want to mention a separate topic called mode tracking, which is important in several technologies. In our case, it's a study of the way that vibration frequencies change as you change a design parameter. There was a model made of a component of the disk drive, namely the read-write arm, called the armature arm housing. Then there was a model, uh, a finite element model of the mainframe, and then an assembly study that was done. Finally, I challenged two of my doctoral students to study this same industrial problem as a part of their doctoral dissertations. The sponsor of this project was Irwin International of Ann Arbor, Michigan. The president was Sam Irwin, who had made his fortune in an earlier corporation that made intelligent terminals. Sam sold that company to a larger corporation and was reputed to have made some tens of millions of dollars on that deal. So this was a new venture, and Sam, I think, correctly interpreted the enormous need for disk drives to be put in smaller computers, such as the personal computers. The device that we're going to look at was a 5-inch micro Winchester disk drive that's named after the Winchester disk drive that the IBM Corporation had made. Now, the disk drive is made of several components. When assembled together, it was hoped their lowest frequency would be 500 hertz or higher. This was so that you didn't get some kind of resonance with the drive speed of the disk, uh, and particular with other components such as ball bearings that might give multiple harmonics of that. Uh, we spend a fair amount of time looking at the read-write arm called the armature arm, and it's a sort of a truss uh, construction. There's also an aluminum mainframe casting. There, there is a shaft for the armature arm, and there's a spindle, a, a disc hub, and the disc itself for the spinning media. Another professor, John Taylor, helped on this project and was instrumental in redesigning the armature arm as a Virendale truss. Irwin International had a fast Fourier analyzer, uh, including the crystal hammers that are used to tap a structure and then infer the natural frequencies. Their in-house engineers were electrical engineers, not structural dynamicists. So they really did need a little bit of help on this project, especially interpreting mode shapes. I think they had a pretty good concept about normal mode frequencies, but I think they didn't really understand the normal modes themselves. Particularly, I think boundary conditions were a little bit of a puzzle for them. I can show you one of the disk drives that I picked up from Irwin International. This is one that's a partial assembly. It has the media here, which is a magnetic material that spins. There's a hub that uh, it is clamped to. On the back side, uh, with the spindle pr protruding through the one side of the casting to the other, is the motor that drives the media. Um, over here, this um, nice arm-like thing is being controlled also by a, a motor and positions this read-write arm. And it moves in a rotational way rather than translational, which uh, is probably a little more common today. Both are used nowadays. The Winchester um, heads are not uh, mounted on here. They were spring-loaded and would read both the top and the bottom side of the disk at the same time. Uh, the hole that you see here was filled with quite a large air filter, and it turns out that filtering out smoke particles is very important. The Winchester 
head rides something like 12, mil, uh, 12 microns over the surface of the disk, and a smoke particle particle can be as high as 15 microns uh, bumping up from the disk if it's stuck there. And that can cause the Winchester head to crash. So there is some worry about keeping that um, the bay in which the spinning disk is located uh, absolutely clean. Here's a cover that will go over the spinning disk area. It's getting a little tarnished now. It, the final version was an aluminum cover stiffened with some uh, stiffeners embedded in it. And it was decided to make it a structural member as a result of some of our earlier calculations that showed that the uh, system was too flexible. To achieve that, there's a labyrinth uh, groove here for an O-ring that will keep the airtight nature and then there are bolts that draw this cover down and you get a hard flush seal metal on metal that provides the structural continuity. Now in the next two figures I'm going to discuss design considerations for this disk drive. I, I sat down and wrote out a few things when we were speaking with Olivetti about using this um, this drive in one of their computers. First of all, on the structural performance side, we would like to have um, good vibration characteristics. That has been um, printed in red to show that's something that uh, I did work on, as well as the air flow through the system and the air seal. I didn't really work on reliability, stress, fatigue, or corrosion. Those were going to be probably long-term problems, uh, the reliability and corrosion. Uh, stress and fatigue problems were probably not going to occur, although if this were a uh, defense project that many, many lives defended, depended upon, I think you would probably do more work up front on those things. Uh, here's a small sketch of the, of the body. We now follow up with these topics. Um, the economics of the production of such a device are, are of course almost overriding in importance. Manufacturing concepts, and that's where it ultimately failed. Uh, maintenance uh, would have been a long-term problem. Making sure there was an adequate supply of electrical components primarily, but also mechanical components. Uh, I was made aware that the electrical industry uh, depends um, so much on their vendors that they require multiple source. I think the automotive companies do as well. Aesthetics. Yes, we want this device not to make a lot of noise and, and to look reasonably nice, but that's not a big thing. It's hidden inside the computer and the noise levels were not very bad. As far as safety and, and pollution, other sorts of things, about the only thing that came up was the danger of the spinning disc throwing pieces off from it. An earlier model had done that when they had weighted it with some lead chunks. Uh, but generally speaking, it's confined inside a computer and wouldn't be a danger. It's not so likely that the little disk drive itself would pollute the environment. It's more likely that the environment would pollute it, particularly from smoking. As I mentioned earlier, that is a large hazard for computers, and I believe if any of the viewers do smoke, if you knew how hard it is to keep those smoke particles out and how bad they are, you, you wouldn't smoke near your disk drive. Earlier, I mentioned the concept of mode tracking. That's a fairly important problem in several industries when you're trying to follow the natural frequencies of a system over some parameter range. Now for aircraft, often wind speed is the parameter that's changing. And people like to do ground vibration studies or air off studies and then check those frequencies again as the system is flown 100 miles an hour, 200, 300, and so on. Sometimes what happens to those natural frequencies and the shape of the normal modes uh, can determine whether you get wing flutter or other bad situations. In our problem, we're going to look at the uh, 
baseline design shown with this bottom set of frequencies. Now the spectrum goes on out to much higher frequencies. But there would be certain frequencies that could be tested with the original design. Now if their design changes, and we did it by stiffening the armature arm in, in the case of its frequencies, we found that we got a, another set of frequencies and later another set yet. One thing that's a worry is that the modes will cross as shown here. Um, I'm mentioning it here in our energy conserving system only because it's a matter of understanding the system. In non-conservative systems with fluid flow over a body, for instance, or with suitable controls that have instabilities, then sometimes these crossings can cause fluttering motion. So um, one way or the other, you want to understand what these mode crossings are. And a way to do that is to make relatively small changes in your parameters so that you get cuts through the frequency spectrum uh, at fine distances. It's possible for one of the lower frequencies, such as this one here, to actually disappear out of the figure. And we do that in um, our redesign of the armature arm. It's also possible for a higher frequency up here to come clear down and become the lower one and then go back up again. So very important to consider what's going on. Now, one way that's done is to think of the mode shape as a way of describing the mode, not just as frequency, and you can then perhaps do correlations between the perturbed set of frequencies up here and the uh, original baseline ones here. Often people will give names to those modes. Um, in automobile and truck situations, there are various uh, tramping modes and different names given to the different vibration modes. In aircraft, we have wing torsion, we have wing bending, and you have fuselage bending, fuselage torsion, and so on. Constructing a figure such as, as we've done here is important, and these are quite often used in study of flutter of aircraft. So you want to watch for the frequency crossings, partly to not lose your understanding of the system at some high change situation, and then also because of the danger, especially when there's an energy source somewhere, of having a flutter-like instability. Let me start with a discussion of a component of this device, namely the armature arm housing. We can take another brief look here just to remind you of the piece that we're speaking of. It's this swinging arm that's kind of the key to the tracking on the uh, particular circle of information that you need. Well, we'd like to raise the natural frequencies of that arm. Basically, it's uh, here's an older design shown here, and this arm pivots on a shaft shown here with the light green line. The arm is about five inches long and uh, roughly an inch and three sixteenths wide, half inch deep. It's controlled uh, by rotation about this shaft, and so there's really only one degree of freedom in the problem. I think of that particular motion as rigid body rotation in that the body is fairly stiff uh, in that plane and you're hoping just to center it on the particular information track of interest. And you'd like that to happen without a lot of distortion in the arm. Now the arm will slew at some probably moderate frequency, so you are going to whip it around a little bit, and uh, if the arm were very flexible in that plane, then you'd be in trouble. This particular part of the total project on the armature arm was carried out by a graduate student. He was available during the summer and I wanted to go on vacation, so I put it in his lap and gave him a month to do the job. Hopefully it was to have been done with a thousand degrees of freedom and then it would have fit into a larger system model of about 5,000 degrees of freedom. Uh, when, to my surprise, when I came back from vacation, he'd actually used many, many more degrees of freedom than that and made the problem too difficult so that it didn't uh, 
really uh, have a chance to be a part of a larger system with the computing capacity that I had uh, allowable at that time. So from that standpoint, it was a little bit of a bust in terms of the relevance for the system model, but we learned so much as a component that that carried forward. Um, the first thing that I do on uh, a project like this is to do the physical modeling, and then I follow that with finite element modeling. So physically, the question is, is that little arm, uh, is it a linear elastic situation? Well, yeah, the material is aluminum, although later on it was made out of magnesium. Uh, we do use small deflection theory, and that's appropriate because you're moving this uh, read right arm through relatively small motions, although quickly moving it around. Um, on this particular sub-problem, I did assume that the shaft was rigid. So we were looking more or less at the vibration properties of the elastic arm and not the mounting system which held it in place. The um, so-called rigid body rotation of the rotation of the arm about its axis was restrained by a spring, a weak spring. And I did that much in the way that experimentalists do when they like to have a body not drift off into space and they mount it on weak springs. There also was, at the time I did this, some problem with some of the methods on getting zero frequencies. And so it was a common practice to put a very weak centering spring to hold your body in position. And then that gave very low frequencies of a couple hertz uh, for that kind of motion. I really wanted to know about frequencies below 2,000 hertz, uh, thinking that then I would understand the problem pretty well, and I, I might want to understand the first 10 natural frequencies. There were fewer than uh, 10 below 2,000 hertz. In fact, I went on up, uh, as you'll see on the next figure, to some 7,000 hertz looking at the frequencies. Uh, this was a biggie, though, to model as a solid rather than a plate structure. It would have saved a lot of degrees of freedom to have only modeled that um, casting as a, a set of plates. The little sections were pretty thin compared with their planned dimensions, except for the relatively rigid hub of that read right arm. Now, um, I might have had to have the hub still model as a solid, but then have the little plates embedded into it, uh, the little plates that made up the arm itself. Were I to do it over again, I believe I would treat that as a plate model. I did include lightning holes, and uh, there was quite a bit of cutout material, so it made uh, a, really a dominating difference on the design. I decided not to include the Winchester head because that was going to be common to all of our studies, and I was trying to optimize the read right arm uh, as well as the other parts of the casting, motors, and so on. So I thought I would leave that out. I did want to put in, though, a relatively heavy armature and sensing pair of coils in the base of the armature arm. They both drove the arm and then sensed where it was positioned. Now let's talk about the details of the finite element modeling. I use the MSC NASTRAN finite element code for this study. We use solid elements, we use the hexa element, 20 noted elements, that was probably overkill. Our model ended up with uh, way too many degrees of freedom the first time it was done. An interesting thing was that I made a foam model out of polyurethane foam, and by cutting out the holes in the proper places, we found that it was really a bad design. When you picked it up, it literally folded about a certain hinge line that I'll point out in the next uh, figure. So uh, I gained some respect for making some simple models of things. Had they or done the original design with that in mind, they would have realized how weak this particular design was in re with respect to this particular kind of a deformation. Now, you might think of that as a strength problem, but we're worried about stiffness, so uh, if it collapsed that easily about some hinge line, it probably was relatively weak in, in flexural bending in uh, vibration also about that hinge line. 
Now, we want to keep the degrees of freedom below 1,000 so that this can fit into a, a larger system model. The spring stiffness to restrain the rotational mode, I would like to be so weak that your rotational frequency would be far less than the first elastic frequency. I use the inverse power method of solution from 0 to 7,000 hertz. That would have given me my zero frequencies had I not used the spring up above. And so uh, I think my use of the spring was a little bit um, of an artifice and not really needed, uh, particularly nowadays. Well, the results that came out after the solution did identify the normal modes of the system. I wasn't very surprised about the rigid rotation about the shaft because we knew that was controlled with just a soft spring and it's a very low frequency of a couple hertz. Uh, then the lowest mode, the lowest real elastic mode was the bending mode. Then there was one that I called spreading in which the two surfaces, the upper and the lower surface of the arm, uh, vibrated out of phase. And then there was a kind of a torsional mode, and then on up. So you can see I'm naming my modes here, like Elmer and Fred and George. Now let me show you the finite element mesh that we used on this baseline model. The original armature arm shown here has these rather large lightning holes. When I made the foam model, it showed immediately that this was a poor design in that uh, along this axis here, the outer arms would just collapse. So the lightning hole tended to undercut the um, what would amount to the root of a cantilever beam here. There was one post located in this body out in here, and that held the surfaces together a bit. The Micro Winchester heads were located on two springs that came from the tip of the armature arm out here, and then they projected out over the spinning disc. The disc itself then had to clear this arm and, and came through in an arc, something like this. Actually, the amount of the total surface area that was written on was, was not dominant. I think it was probably half or so of the disk area, so there's a lot of waste uh, uh, magnetic uh, space there to, to, toward the outer rim and toward the uh, hub of the spinning disk. The rigid shaft went through this point. Here is a gap where the coil of the armature uh, was embedded in epoxy, and I did model that, both the mass of the copper wire and the epoxy. There was a small sensing coil at this location that would uh, tell where the armature arm was at any instant of time. That was found to be misplaced and interfered or was interfered with the armature coil, and so they later moved that uh, smaller coil to the other side of the uh, deck of the casting, the main, the main floor of the casting, to protect the sensing coil. Well, after running the uh, modal analysis, we came up with the first rigid body mode as expected here, with the displacement shown in red. There was a small spring that was connected so as to uh, give this some very low frequency. There was no elastic deformation to speak of except in the small. The second and third modes were indeed elastic modes shown here. Because of the post uh, at this location, the upper and lower surfaces of the armature arm had to move together, but the outer parts of that arm were free to move either uh, in synchronization as shown in the top figure or out of synchronization as shown below. In both cases, when I showed these figures to the electrical engineers, they gasped, oh no, the arms are hitting each other, you know, you can't have that. Well, of course, now that we're experienced structural mechanics people here, structural dynamicists, we know that these motions really are infinitesimal and that the 
plotting package of the computer just enhances those infinitesimal displacements until they're large enough for us to see. Uh, many plot packages will make the largest deformation perhaps 10% of the total figure size. So this gets your attention, that's for sure. Uh, the frequencies 692 and 1031 are pretty low considering that we want the entire assembled system to have a frequency uh, above 500 hertz. And there's a lot of flexibility here just in these uh, two modes. Some of the higher modes for this arm have substantial motion of this tail of the arm back where the coils are. It's relatively massive uh, considering the, uh, the total system and, and that this is a pretty small system. And this tail would kind of flap up and down. I think I had one that I called a tail flap mode. That wouldn't bother too much in the sense that you're trying to track uh, the location of the Winchester heads out at the tip. And so provided the uh, outboard part of this arm was reasonably well behaved, you might not even care if the tail would flap around. So it's good to get a physical interpretation for what these elastic modes are. Perhaps you can live with some and not with others. One thing that is true is that the bending problem shown here is not really that disastrous uh, in the sense that uh, if you've seen a vinyl phonograph record played on a conventional phonograph, you notice the needle can ride up and down in the vertical direction um, if there's any warpage of the disc. On the other hand, side to side slewing motion would be a disaster. These Winchester heads have a little bit of that same characteristic in that they're spring-loaded in the vertical direction and they can um, move in that direction without losing uh, acquisition of the track. But again, the slewing direction would be the one that would be a bad kind of motion uh, if it were elastically coupled into the uh, modes of this armature arm. There were a total of three finite element frequency runs made. The first two had to do with the baseline design and then a modified baseline design where two more posts were added between the upper and lower surfaces of the arm. The third study had to do with a complete redesign where John Taylor helped lay out a Virendale truss and was able to lighten the structure and make it look prettier as well. You probably remember my saying that this model with 4,800 degrees of freedom was too complicated for the final system model, uh, but it was easy to modify and add a couple posts outboard to give us a second run. The third run shown here came in under 1,000 degrees of freedom as I had desired, and this was another graduate student, Kim, who did this particular job and did a nice job on that. Now, if the difference in design one and design two had to do with adding posts outboard, then it turns out that has no effect on the rigid body rotation on the uh, rigid shaft. Uh, neither did the redesign later. Uh, but those outboard posts did stiffen the first bending mode. Uh, that could be expected because you would have a shear coupling then between the top and bottom fibers of something acting in a beam-like manner. But the spreading mode was really greatly affected because those um, outboard posts prevented the spreading mode from happening at any reasonably low frequency at all. Now, it wouldn't make this frequency go to infinity. It would just make it up in tens of thousands of hertz. If you made me guess, I might have seen that somewhere around 20,000 hertz. I, I, I think at one time I located what that, uh, where that frequency uh, had moved to. The torsional mode was one that I didn't show in our earlier figures of the mode shapes. Uh, it too is stiffened by adding outboard posts. The um, later design, the, the redesign as a Verndale truss was here and you can see there's quite a bit of help now on the first bending mode moving up to 1,028 hertz as opposed to 692. 
And in my mind, this was a good uh, uh, goal, was to get all the components up above 1,000 hertz, hoping then that the assembled system would be above 500 hertz. After these studies on the armature arm, we made a few conclusions. One was that you needed to have posts outboard on the armature arm. That somewhat conflicted with the requirement for getting the disc to pass between those two portions of the arm, but turned out not to be a big problem. Um, still, the uh, armature arm wrapped around the disc in the extreme position, as shown, uh, but that all, that all worked out fine. We reshaped the whole pattern, made the armature arm substantially lighter, we tapered the cross section shown here. There wasn't as much need for material out at these free edges, and um, material there tends to add more mass than it does stiffness to the total armature arm, so better to lighten that up. Um, the people at Irwin International were quite happy with the redesigned armature arm, and it was ultimately made out of magnesium. After completing the armature arm problem, then I was asked to do the main frame normal modes. This was a single piece aluminum casting. Uh, one problem is that you're not allowed with a casting to have sections that are thinner than a certain amount because of possible cracking. In this case, uh, and at the time we were doing this, 90 thousandths of an inch thick was what they wanted to maintain. That's a little bit heavy. I'm sure they do better than that nowadays. Uh, 90 thousandths would be a little over two millimeters. Here's the casting. It's the same one that I've shown you the actual model of. Uh, it's aluminum, thin walled, has a lot of reinforcing ribs, uh, but the natural frequencies were too low. They were um, 318 hertz and 478 hertz um, as we calculated them and measured them. Uh, we were afraid that vibration at those lower frequencies might couple in with the rotational rates here um, and, and harmonics of that, the way the ball bearings would move around in the races. Um, the rotation speed was about 3,000 RPM or about 50 hertz at that time. So um, that 50 hertz dominant motion is kind of the driveline motion of the system, and then depending how your bearings act, you can, and, and uh, if there's some nonlinear excitation there, you might get uh, so-called super harmonics up at 100 hertz, 150, 200, and so on. It was felt that if we could stiffen this casting and raise all natural frequencies above 500 hertz, we would be okay. I did the model on this mainframe casting myself. Uh, probably there wasn't a student available to do the dirty work, so I got in and pitched in. I modeled it as a stiffened plate structure. Uh, I assume small deflections, very reasonable thing to do, and that the material is linear and elastic. I was interested in frequencies below 2000 hertz, at least to clear out what all those were. Again, I use the trick as an experimentalist would of supporting the casting on soft spring so that it wouldn't have the uh, zero frequencies for the six rigid body modes. That's not really necessary in our theories nowadays, although you see we did actually do some of the experiments that way and to some extent uh, that, that made sense. The Finite element modeling made use of quad four plate elements and, and bar elements, which are beam, compact beam elements. I was able to keep the degrees of freedom just below 1,000. I used inverse power, and I actually searched up through 3,000 hertz for frequencies. The lowest two elastic modes were of great interest to Irwin International. They came in at 318 hertz and 478, both in the danger region. The lower one, um, as you might expect after you think about it a little, is a twisting mode, uh, and I'll view it from the open end of the casting as shown. Uh, 
The uh, far end might have, for instance, this green deformation pattern, and the near end might have this blue pattern. Uh, this is a little bit like the vibration of a thin-walled open cross-section beam, and you know that uh, that is a particularly uh, flexible kind of motion for open section beams. So it kind of makes sense. It's sort of a torsional motion. Then the cylindrical bending is shown here where the walls alternately flop outward and inward um, uh, and that happens along the length of the casting. So I'm calling it cylindrical in the general sense. It's a general cylinder shape. 478 hertz still in the bad region. So we did confirm uh, the two frequencies. It had been picked up by the fast Fourier transform methods and uh, our answers were not very far from the true experimental values. They, it was 5 or 10 hertz off or, or even less. So it was an excellent confirmation of what had been picked up experimentally. Now uh, to help them on this uh, uh, design, we decided to stiffen up, especially on the open ends at the floor with some stiffeners. Uh, we tried to stiffen the floor and the motor well to help a bit there. And a big change that we decided was to convert from a cover that was over the spinning disc that originally was kind of a cosmetic cover just to clear plastic and just kind of a simple non-structural member over to a true aluminum strong stiff cover uh, that used a labyrinth seal uh, for, with an o-ring to actually make a dust tight connection but then was bolted down so as to provide a hard metal connection and give some stiffness to the structure. So it really helped, especially on that torsional mode, to keep the body from having these low frequencies. After doing those two major components and seeing how to stiffen them up separately, we decided to put the system together. And this assembly was going to include the rotating parts of the disc and the, uh, with its hub, with the spindle and the motor.